scorn scorn I don't think there's anything about life worth learning that you can't pick up from American teen movies. Sure, Sun Tzu might have had some wisdom to dispense, but until someone updates the art of war to say whether or not you can just ask people why they're white, Karen, oh my god, I'll stand by clueless, heavers and book smart, a seminal text, the seminal text on modern life. And yet, if teen movies have taught me anything, and considering I literally did a master's degree on them, I really hope they have, it's that nothing is quite as important as being yourself and there is everything to be celebrated about being different. This is why I love Major League Rugby, an outcast sent to sit on their own at lunchtime. MLR is the oddball that doesn't quite fit in with the plastics of Europe, the theatre geeks of Super Rugby, or even the cool Asians in the top league. Its family don't quite get it. Cool older brother? Major League Soccer is currently applying to the cool colleges. Cousins, NHL and NBA barely know they exist, and American Rugby's dad, the NFL, who weirdly is younger than their son, looks down its nose patronisingly to our scrappy young hero. MLR is the perfect protagonist for a high concept team movie that nobody will ever seemingly let me make. Because approached from either a rugby or an American sports market perspective, MLR is weird. But in a kind of John Hughesy way that means actually, really, they're super hot, they're just wearing glasses. Set up to chase a golden goose that had already laid all its eggs, instead of the intended cross-Atlantic cash cow, after two and a half seasons, MLR is blossoming into a kind of mad explosive alternative to any other sporting entertainment. It helps that rugby itself is like someone crossed gridiron with thermite, but the league is unlike anything else. Their season might be over for now, but with new teams sprouting up all the time and more and more high profile players jumping across the pond all the time, it's worth exploring just why you should all be really totally butt crazy in love with MLR. The story of Major League Rugby is itself, once again, much like a teen movie. Nerdy Girl, the United States of America, was convinced the oh-so-dreamy prospect of professional rugby didn't know they existed. Until, out of nowhere, in 2015, he asked her to the prom. And, before the US can even consider whether it's too good to be true, Pro Rugby begins. Now, Pro Rugby was the bonkers brainchild of a former Bonds trader named Douglas Schroeninger. And that name proved perficient because this was a league that was never dead nor alive. Schroeninger had scarcely heard the word ruck in his life until he happened to watch a match at the 2015 World Cup in London whilst on hashtag business. And... As 80,000 people screamed at the referee, Schroeninger, who I presume is a cartoon oil baron, that's, that's how he pictures it in my head, had dollar signs flash from his eyes. The American public didn't know it yet, but they needed rugby. And they pay so much for the privilege of finding out. And so, one year and one copy of Rugby Union for Dummies later, Schroeninger is ploughing what ended up being around $6 million of his own money into starting the USA's first pro rugby league. Except the moment the USA arrived at prom, she realised it should have been obvious. Schroeninger might have been well-meaning, but as the end of the building, down poured the buckets of blood. Pro rugby lasted one season before falling into an enormous and litigious mess. A disagreement between Schroeninger and USA Rugby underpinning the first season. A kind of ugly undercurrent everyone avoided to focus on the fact that players were actually being paid to play like full-time rugby in America. It was actually happening. But given an off-season in which to just focus on that and not have rugby being played, Schroeninger went for some extreme brinksmanship tactics, terminating the contracts of every single player in the league because the national governing body refused to grant him exclusive rights to operate a pro league in America. Everything fell apart, and <laughs> because it's the USA, the legal case is still not over. However, the death of pro rugby ultimately proved to be the Mockingjay moment. That autumn, having seen what might be possible, clubs began to gather and discuss amongst themselves the foundation of a new league, learning from the mistakes of their predecessor. And so, just 10 months on from the first match in that first league, from its ashes emerges Major League Rugby, the league on fire. There's a callback. Six of the seven teams who would compete in their opening season a year later were in place, with the one addition being a new specially created franchise. And so the league begins. Now, Major League Rugby has two basic purposes. One, 
to grow rugby in the USA, both financially and culturally. Unlike pro rugby, there are no ambitions to overthrow the NBA or change the NFL's tagline to America's forward pastime, but just to turn rugby into a game that families in Kentucky or Maine might go to watch on a Sunday. The idea is to make rugby a legitimate sport in the US rather than to make rugby the biggest sport in the US. And this then has a knock-on effect on the second purpose, which is to develop talent for the national team, the USA Eagles. Unlike kick 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 sock 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 kick 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 sock ball 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 where many consider the domestic league a higher honour than the international competition, or baseball where the World Series is contested between Boston and New York, not France and Uruguay. Rugby is nominally built in quite a direct pyramid structure. International rugby is the main game, it's the pinnacle, the highest standard, the highest prestige, the highest pay, the best players playing the best quality rugby. Whilst most pro leagues are competitive in their own right in rugby, they're often really kind of there to feed and create the next international players. Each layer feeds the next. Each level's job is to create players capable of playing at the next intensity up. Grassroots feeds semi-pro, semi-pro feeds the second tier pro competitions, which in turn feeds the top flight leagues, which in turn then can be stepped up to the European Cup standard and to the kind of Super Rugby playoff standard, which eventually then feeds into test matches, which can then be taken one step further into World Cups, and then you also have the kind of the World Cup semi and final and Lion Series matches. It's a linear system, and as a player, you normally work your way up or down. There are no real lateral moves, and beyond the age of about 19, you rarely see players jumping more than one step at a time. However, there's one key exception to that pyramid, because Major League Rugby looks at this structure and laughs. Like Glenn Frey in 1971, the eventual goal is still to create eagles, but otherwise MLR exists simultaneously on every single point of this pyramid. MLR is every member of the Breakfast Club at once. Whilst the Premiership might have moments of mistakes, you can watch 30 seconds of Major League Rugby and see every possible variation of the sport imaginable. In one patch of the play, the standard goes from a chuckabout in the park to the World Cup final. It's brilliant. The worst pass you've ever seen might result in a spellbinding moment of genius. A kick 30 metres off target might lead to the most acrobatic, beautiful bit of skill. You'll see it on any pitch in any sport all year. MLR is openly and wonderfully mad. Whereas other leagues have established styles, MLR is just as likely to show you the unapologetic flair of Super Rugby, the uninhibited risk-taking of the Pro 14, or the genuine cannibalism of the Pro Duh. And that's just in the crowd. This leads to a beautifully unique style of rugby. The closest thing is probably really the women's Six Nations in that offence is far more consistently elite standard than defence. Teams tend to organise as per the top flight sides you'll see in Test Rugby, but play is slightly more instinctive. Defences aren't nearly as quick as they are in Europe, so players are given an extra half second to make decisions. And just look what a truly world class player can do with that time. Mononu might not be on as strict a diet as he was with the All Blacks, but he has such vision. It's incredible to watch him tear things up, spotting space others couldn't even see. Kicking tactics are fairly old school in that they either tend to be attack-minded chips and grubbers or a traditional kind of sacrifice of possession for territory rather than the more modern approach which is basing it around chasing and momentum of hanging a high ball and telling your winger to go and make fetch happen. Breakdowns tend to be won quickly or stood off entirely. Former England skipper Chris Robshaw is headed over partly because he's a big name and a handsome lad but he's exactly the kind of player MLR is very light on. Irritants who slow opposition ball and make life difficult as possible for the opposition nine. I recognise that sentence probably makes no sense if you're a rugby outsider and kind of watching this to get a background on this new league you're thinking about maybe watching. But basically, right, teams in MLR tend to retain their own possession unless they make a handling error or kick it away more often than in a lot of other leagues. There are some players who are experts in making that far less simple. One such man is headed over the league next season. Because that's what an MLR squad looks like. Teams are made up of an equal mix of world-class, worldwide stars of the game and normal working dudes who spent the last few years driving themselves across state lines to play each weekend in what was considered a local derby. There's a novelty to it that's unlike anything else. MLR is a vivid, magical dream where a 90 cap all black centre partner is a conspiracy theorist who used to work in a shoe shop. It's a league where 10 down Tarariwa, one of the best props of all time, follows up causing literal chaos in the World Cup, but the actual World Cup final, by being eaten alive by a part-timer. Look at this step by teacher and part-time juggler Danny Collins. He's beating Marnonu. All-time great double World Cup winner, Marnonu. 
Martin Lund is being turned inside out by a forgotten Al Pacino film. Because that's the best thing about MLR, on every front it has to be seen to be relieved. I could tell you, right now, that I am a huge fan of the Denver log lines and their starting halfback combination of Francois Pastel and Mikey Johnson III. I'm not! They don't exist! Yet if I told you they'd formed a deadly partnership with Argentina legend Felipe Contepomio the last year, you'd honestly believe it. I could tell you that Atlanta have a winger called Harley Davidson. And not even that would be too far, because it's true! My name's Harley Davidson and I play wing with the Glendale Raptors. There's a, there's a winger playing for Atlanta called Harley... Harley Davidson? No, it's not like the prop called Ferrari who plays for Italy. No, the quickest player is called Harley Davidson! MLR has a winger called Harley... Come on! You can't not love this. If you're new to rugby, chances are little of this will mean anything to you, but trust me when I say the joy is infectious. There's still the old teething problem, the match presentation obviously doesn't have the budget of the coverage in Europe, and crowds may not match up to Friday Night Lights, but it's just... fun? Major League Rugby is the oddball nobody who moved here from another school and is often ignored or picked on unfairly, but really? Scratch beneath the surface and they're the coolest, wisest, funniest kid in school. Rough around the edges and still a work in progress, but this kid could teach Sun Tzu a few things, and not just about like, skateboarding or iPhones. Major League Rugby doesn't return until early next year, but there's no way this wonderful, weird kid should be allowed to sit alone at lunchtimes anymore. Thank you for watching that, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I am going to pick this up and do a video on the actual teams in MLR, the actual teams contesting it, close to the time of it coming back, so that's something to hopefully look forward to. In the meantime, some of you may have noticed that my video on the Springboks winning the World Cup, um, the kind of 36-minute analysis of the whole campaign, has been taken down. I was asked to take it down by a representative of World Rugby, um, unfortunately. So hopefully it's going to go back up at some point. I can't tell you anymore, I can't tell you when or anything along those lines um it also meant i had to kind of press pause and shelve the three videos i was working on next uh one of which being the video on how did japan beat the spring box in 2015 uh so they've all kind of gone on the pile and hopefully i managed to get back to them at some point hopefully there's progress on these issues i can't say for certain at the minute in the meantime i have been doing this podcast on the 2011 world cup if anyone wants to look at that going over every single game uh one by one an episode in each one we're getting quite far through the pool stage right now uh, that's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on all the kind of usual podcast platforms as well as some stuff I've been doing for World Rugby as well, up on their channel, uh, just to kind of tick, keep things ticking over. Hopefully there will be things back far sooner, quite immediately, on rugby I am allowed to talk about, I am allowed to use, you know, stuff from, uh, as well as a new series that I am hoping to get going quite soon. It's hopefully, you know, fun, fun if nothing else. Um, as a bonus, because rugby is going to be back quite soon. We've got the Premiership coming back in a couple of weeks with our Super Rugby Retro, which I haven't been able to talk about as well, because Super Rugby are notorious. They will rip anything down. They'll have the channel deleted. I've made videos on that. Um, so, yes, anyway, thank you very much. I've talked very, very quickly there. Hopefully, I've got the details across, and I'll see you very soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I guess I've never really like thought about it, because to me, it's just my name. But growing up, my mom's biggest concern is she was worried I was going to get teased, because she didn't like the name at first. But it's been nothing but positive. Everyone loves my name. It's a good icebreaker for sure.